Welcome to the Real Estate Roundtable. My name is Adriana Montes. I'm your host for today's show. I'm with Florida Dreams Realty, and I'm so happy that you're here joining us today. Today we have a special guest. His name is Justin Ford from Pax Properties. We're so delighted to have him here. Welcome, Justin. Hi, Adriana. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Justin. We want to do this show just to tell our viewers how special it is, Pax Properties, your company, and how passionate are you about real estate and so much world of knowledge that you have to share with us. So let's start by telling us a little bit about you. Where are you from? What about having kids? Where did you come from? Some some background history about your life. Sure. Okay. So um, I'm originally from New York, from Long Island, uh, and also lived and worked in the city uh, many years. And um, came to Florida about 30 years ago. Um, we have, uh, my ex-wife and I have uh, three grown boys, um, and two of them are in New York now, and one's in Florida. My youngest one actually works with us at Pax Properties. He uh, helps head up our finance department. Um, I, um, I'm the youngest of eight kids, um, back in the day when you used to have lots of big families, and uh, which, is a, which is a great thing. And uh, <clears throat> um, I will tell you that in my family, we did have, we had no real estate experience. My dad owned his home, of course. Um, and what I saw when I was a kid was, my dad was a World War II generation and, and all my friends, their, their parents and all that, whatever they worked in, my dad was a college professor, so was my mother. Um, and whatever folks worked in, if they owned a home, they retired comfortably. And I came to realize that just owning a home made a big difference, right? Uh, in, in, in one's financial well-being, especially when they got older, right? And uh, imagine if you own two homes, what would that be? What if you own three? What if you own 300? What if you wow, own- Wow, that would be amazing, home? yes. Right, so there's, there's this idea. And then, uh, so to give you a little bit more background though, before I got into real estate. I didn't get into real estate very, uh, I was in my early 40s before I bought my first investment property. It was a four unit property. And I bought a bunch of houses and things like that. Um, but before that, and, and by the way, today, of course, we've done a little over 1,400 units, uh, residential and hospitality. We have a shopping center as well. We've bought some land and uh, we continue to grow uh, at a significant pace. We may buy over the next year as much as we bought in the last three or four years. But, uh, but we'll, we'll see how opportunities pre present themselves. But before getting to real estate, I, I've, I've done uh, many, many different careers. You know, I, I traveled the world. I, uh, I was a vagabond for quite a while. I picked up, uh, I lived in South America for a little over a year uh, as an exchange student. I heard um, that you speak Spanish, Justin, very fluently. Si, hablo espanol. No, I do. I speak it fairly fluently. I do. And uh, and then I lived in Italy for a while. I taught exercises in there. I, uh, it sounds like your dog speaks Spanish too. Juan, si Juan, uh, yeah, Juan is answering to, to you. There you go. Uh, um, before I forget, we also have a guest in, in here, Eric Fraser, uh, who's going to be joining us in the show. And Eric, you're willing to jump into any questions you may have for Justin today. So. Uh, thank you, uh, Adriana. I'm just uh, fascinated by Justin's story so far. Uh, eight, yeah. you know, the youngest of eight. I'm the oldest of seven. So, oh, really? Yeah, yeah you know. so I know how tough it was for my little brother. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, but just to finish the background, so I lived in Italy for a while, France for a little while. I, I sold encyclopedias door to door in the Midwest, got my degree in English literature of all things. Um, and um, of course, once you get your degree in English literature, the first thing you do is you go bartend. I was a bartender for many years. And then I, uh, and then I, you know, I did other things. I worked in the city. I was in corporate uh, barter. And then I spent about 20 years in, in uh, financial publishing with a group called Agora, which is an amazing newsletter publishing group. They're now the largest in the world. And they're a fascinating um, libertarian style group. Uh, you know, they, they really are focused on sort of individual freedom and things like that. And, um, and, and that was fascinating. So for 20 years, I covered international stocks and bonds and currencies as publishers and editors, as a writer in former Soviet Union and China and throughout Latin America. Um, and of course the U.S. markets, and uh, so that was a great grounding. By the time I got to my first uh, investment property, which was around two, 2002, so there's the short background of where leading everything up. <laughs> wow! Yeah. 
So you had a background on selling an encyclopedia encyclopedias door to door, which is amazing. It takes a lot of guts to knock on somebody's door and say, do you want to buy this huge book, right? Yeah, well, there's um, a whole series of books. Now that you can fit it like, in, you know, the, the size of a pen. Yeah, I used to sell them, yeah. And I would, I sold a set of encyclopedias to, uh, to a couple that already had two sets. I sent them their third set, sold them their third set. <laughs> so, my God. And then Google yeah. came over and took over that business. And then... Yeah, much, to, much later, yeah. Yeah, you went into financial education and and research from what I understand. And they gave you a really good background about numbers. And not yeah. only that, but you also traveled the world, which actually I believe that traveling, I've uh, been to 56 countries myself and traveling uh, makes you makes you a better human, makes you more understanding of other people, other cultures, more empathetic. So that's a great background uh, to come into real estate and understand why uh, the dream of home ownership is so important. Why somebody, everybody wants to have a home, especially now after COVID, we came back to the value of our home. A home is where you work, where you sleep, where you have fun, where you invite friends. So, and, and then bringing that into a career. That's amazing. That's amazing. Everything you're telling us so far. Yeah. So how do you start Pax Properties and why did you pick that name? Um, I, well, I started it, uh, you know, just on my own buying, how, well, like my first four units, I bought my brother and then I bought maybe eight or nine properties on my own after that. Um, and then I started raising money and actually, uh, bringing investors in, uh, well, Pax is, uh, it's Latin for peace. And, um, and I just think that's a, uh, it's an admirable, uh, quality to have, uh, it's, it's a good aspirational quality to have in a community. Um, and it's, uh, it's a little bit different than all the glitz and the glamour and the, uh, um, I don't know, focus on, the, um, other stuff. Uh, so I, I just, I just appreciate that name. Um, yeah. And so I started in 2002 doing these little things. And my first thing where I, uh, my modest thing to fame, by the way, we may have covered this in the previous segment, but you know, it's, we've done today, maybe about $160 million worth of real estate. Most of that in the last few years, because we got bigger and bigger. And we may do 160 in the next couple of years, you know, as, as we continue to accelerate our growth. But our, our, our unique um, history involves the fact that we've never been late on a mortgage payment. We've never lost an investor a dollar. That includes the crash of 08 and includes COVID, which we entered with six hotels. Um, we've made plenty of mistakes and we still do. Um, but we focus on a lot of fundamentals, which we can talk about a little bit later, that we think are essentially important. And, uh, and I know that the business I am in is not to you know, predict this market move and that market move and try to outsmart everything and everyone. We're essentially in the business of putting roofs over people's heads. And, uh, and it's one I'm very proud of. And in order to do that correctly, you have to buy right. Because if you, if you pay too much, if you finance incorrectly, if you, if you go over budget, you're not gonna be able to provide those roofs over people's heads because you're, you're not gonna meet your payroll. You're not gonna meet your, all your different bills. So it's very important that you're that you're soundly that you have sound fundamentals uh, when you go into real estate. It's very important that you buy right, and I love your company name, Pax, um, meaning peace um, in Latin. That's beautiful for you to have peace with yourself, with others, and then in the community and have that that uh, mission statement. I know your mission statement is to provide a nice, uh, affordable home ownership to others, and that's that's beautiful to have somebody with um that purpose and intention uh creating so much real estate uh throughout throughout all these all these states um i know eric has a question eric go ahead dustin i i'm so impressed with your story uh your your education in english literature <laughs> and then on top of that um writing uh for this uh libertarian uh publication and and it's through that uh, you got your education about markets, uh, both international and, and local. Mm -hmm. um, your transition to real estate, buying your first property, and from that point, you know, as of today, as you mentioned, 160 million. That's a huge difference between your first, you know, single-family home and where you are today. Can you share with our audience, you know, how did you acquire the money? Uh, the property, that very first property, how did you do it? Uh, and then perhaps the second property, you know, at what point did you feel that, you know, you, number one, 
had a clear understanding of what you were doing uh, and two, had the either support financially, uh, either through um, family and friends or just saving money? Yeah, good question. So um, I think I fundamentally understood it from the beginning uh, because of the experience I had had of, of what I was doing. Um, the one thing I learned about when I was in the financial market, so for instance, uh, you know, I, I understand, let's say, options and futures and and fairly complicated concepts like that. But but the most important thing I really learned in the, in the, in the financial markets was the madness of crowds, that everyone can be crazy at the same time. Everyone that the that the you know that that that, that fairy tale of the um, of the little boy pointing out that the emperor has no clothes, right? Where everyone else pretends the emperor does because it's the emperor and he must he's, he's authority and so forth. But really, markets do get absolutely insane, and that I understood by the time I entered real estate. And that was a big, a big help to me. And 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 as I entered real estate in 2002 and all the way up to 2006 and 2007, you saw it. You know the, the bubble that 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 led to the crash in 2008, which I predicted many times in my writings and so forth, pulled us to tens of thousands of people, um, actually hundreds of thousands of people. Um, the um, <clears throat> uh, that that bubble was not just you know neophyte investors; it was experienced investors. It was banks. It was it was the Federal Reserve. It was it was the head of the National Association of Realtors. Mm -hmm. They were all drinking the, the crazy Kool Aid. Mm -hmm. So the number one thing to realize is that as you enter in this world of, of, of many experts, um, you know there's there's really no experts. There's only the truth, and there are people who can. Uh, and even that, we we never know exactly 100% what it is. But all you can do is make a well reasoned argument. That's really what you can do. And it's not a well-reasoned argument when you're buying something, hoping that it will appreciate because you have no control of appreciation. When you focus on what you can do and you're willing to do it, you're willing to execute, follow through on easy times and on tough times, then that is a much more reasonable plan. Now, um, now to go back to your uh, part of that original question of yours, how I, how I got the money. When I first bought, bought the first house, uh, when I was, again, in my early 40s, the first fourplex, I had saved up some money. I saved up like $25,000 or something. And my brother, Mark, who has, who has a great deal of money, he's well known in the financial publishing world as well. Um, he uh, he put in 25. So we went in 50, 50 partners. We got a mortgage and we bought the thing. Fairly traditional, right? And then from there, um, as I bought more, you know, it was that money was plentiful. So I learned I, I, I got 90% loans, you know, 90% LTV loans. Uh, There's one house I bought where I got 90% LTV loan. And then the... Um, the person I bought it from was a tenant and they prepaid their, their year's rent. So basically it was hundred percent finance. I did things like this, but again, 90% loans can sound risky, right? They are not, if you know what you're doing and if it's the right type of loan, if it's a fixed rate amortizing loan and the income from the property is strong enough to cover that 90% loan or even hundred percent loan by a wide margin, you have to have a margin because things change. Rents drop, economies drop, values drop and they spike and they go up, they go up down. But if you go through, if you go fairly fundamentally, uh, with good fundamental understanding of your risks and, and prepared for the variability, right? Imagine if you went outside every day and you never brought an umbrella, right? You're going to get rained on sometimes, right? Because sometimes you need that umbrella, right? And sometimes you need a warm jacket and it's, the weather changes, right? But you have to be consistent regardless of whether it's snowing or raining or, or, or whatever it is. And right now I'm in Oklahoma, it's 104 degrees, by the way. And, uh, and, um, and those are the fundamentals that see me through. So the money part, initially I got that. And as I built up a little equity, I would tap it and redeploy it to help buy other things. I just scraped to get a little, little, little other, other savings. And with that, I built a portfolio of maybe a 40 unit, 40 units or so by the time the market crashed, I believe. Um, and most of that was through that, that kind of financing. But again, if you're tapping equity to spend it, then you're just, you're just creating a debt that you'll have to pay for from future income, which you have not provided for. But if you're tapping equity to, to buy a property that's going to produce income that, that pays for the, for the new debt that you just took out and more, then that can be wise. I'm not advocating this in a full, wholehearted, uh, blanket statement kind of way. But again, if you understand the fundamentals, but and then I'll just finish the answer to your question. After a while, in 2007, I raised my first bit of money. That's when I started, when I did my first commercial deal. A commercial is typically defined as five units and up, right? So one through four is residential, one through four units and five units up is commercial. 
2007, I bought my first uh, 14 unit property and I raised money for that. And, uh, and then from there, I, I, I reached out mostly to friends and family. Eventually, Eric, I um, used my newsletter platform, even though I no longer work with them. And the, the, the readers of those newsletters would find out about me and only, only appealing to accredited investors. I ended up with hundreds and hundreds of accredited investors, many of whom have become very good friends. I just slept last night in the, in the, in the garage apartment of, of one of my friends who've been investors for 10 years with us now. Uh, he, and his, he and his wife were doctors here in, in uh, Oklahoma, and they've been investing with me for a while. And we've become very good friends. But now, now we're fortunate that we have often more money than we can put, put to use, available to us. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very pleasant outcome when you're committed to honoring your obligations, right? seeing it through the tough times and you're fundamentally based going in. I think those are important, important principles to work with. Justin, thank you so much for uh, sharing that uh, background. And it's interesting how people have become extremely successful in real estate, how they got their start. And it seems like everybody has to buy their first house. And either you're going to save the money or maybe your parents or your family can help you out. But it all begins with getting into the game with that first house and then learning every step of the way. So uh, really, I, I tell you, your, your stock continues to rise. I want to invest with you. <laughs> so, I'm so glad you're with us today. Adriana. Yeah, uh, Justin, I'm also super impressed because you think very different than most people in real estate think. And some people in real estate, they think that real estate is an approach to buy cheap and then get rich fast. Uh, but that's why so many people crashed during the bubble and so many people were upside down and and they lost millions of dollars. So for, for people like you that invest conservative, um, and I claim to be one of them too. I wanna, I wanna you to teach us the fundamentals that have been basing all of your strategies at Pax Properties when you buy multifamilies, when you buy an apartment complex, when you buy um, um, shopping center, a hotel. Uh, I want us to teach us through those four fundamentals that you have at the core of your business. This is the Real Estate Roundtable, Florida. I'm here with Justin Ford from Pax Properties. He's giving us so much information about real estate, about investing in commercial real estate, residential, about how to take uh, good decisions when you buy a property. So we're gonna be going to a commercial break at this moment and we will be right back. Thank you. The Power Is Now magazines are the leading resource for real estate agents, mortgage bankers, entrepreneurs, and small home ownership businesses, providing leaders with business strategy information, resources, and tools through PIN, Real Estate, Programming Guide magazines. Stay up to the minute with real estate news and information from industry experts. Subscription is free. Sign up today. ThePowerIsNow.com. ThePowerIsNow.com. We are back in the Real Estate Roundtable, Florida, with Justin Ford from Pax Properties. I'm so excited with all of this wealth of information that we are getting. And a lot of people in real estate think that you can buy cheap and then get rich very easy and quick with real estate. But we all know that there is no easy cut for success. You have to work hard every day and be consistent. And that's, that's something uh, very important that a lot of people fail to think about when, when the real estate, um, when the bubble happened um, years ago. And that's why a lot of people lost millions, millions of dollars. So you have to be really wise of how the approach that you take on real estate. And this is one of the fundamentals that I've been uh, learning and discussing with Justin for from Pax Properties. And Justin, I would like I would like you to guide us through those fundamentals that you use for real estate, uh, through the purchases that you have on all residential properties, on multifamilies. Well, a lot of people look at real estate superficially. They see people gotten rich in it, and they think, "Oh boy, I can buy a house. I'll put some money down. It'll go up in value, hundred thousand dollars, whatever, and I'll make a hundred thousand dollars, and I'll do it again and again and again." Um, that would be nice if it always worked that way, but it doesn't always work that way, right? Um, here is what really, the way real estate works, the way I see it. There are four primary ways you can make money in real estate. Cash flow, amortization, positive leverage, and appreciation. I've given them the acronym CAPA, C-A-P-A. First three, you can control. You can control whether you buy a property, the cash flows or not. 
you can control whether you put on a, on a mortgage that is an amortizing mortgage or not. And that's a very powerful thing, an amortizing mortgage. It's the most powerful long-term wealth creation force in real estate bar none. And then you can control whether you put, combine the two in a way that produces positive leverage. Positive leverage means it increases the return on your invested capital without dramatically increasing your risk. A lot of people use leverage, but they use negative leverage, leverage that increases their risk, puts them in great peril. Then the fourth one is appreciation. And everyone appreciates appreciation. We all like to see the things we own go up in value, right? But you have zero control over appreciation. And this is part of the, um, this is part of the whole confusion in the real estate. Um, so in, just prior to the boom, the head of the National Association of Realtors, a PhD in economics, wrote a book called, Are You Missing Out on the Real Estate Boom? Why Home Prices Will Continue to Soar Throughout the Decade or something like that. That came out like 2007. My answer to that question, are you missing on the real estate boom, was I hope so, right? But many people weren't. They followed him right off a cliff. And, they, and I don't mean to attack him personally. That's not my intention. But I'm showing that he's the, he's the head of the National Association of Realtors. And he was, he was talking Nostradamus language, like he could predict the future. That was ridiculous. Fundamental, and I, was, I was predicting the markets would correct significantly in writing. But even that doesn't matter. What matters is your strategy. If you're betting on something you can control, and it's like playing roulette in, in Vegas without even understanding how to play roulette. All you're doing is just throwing the ball or throwing the dice or whatever it is. If you focus on the first three factors, cash flow, amortization, positive leverage, those three alone, you can make consistently good returns even if real estate never goes up by a single dollar, not one. I'll give you an example. Do you believe, Adriana and Eric, I'll put you both on the spot, do you believe that I can show you how you can turn $10,000 into $300,000, even if real estate never goes up by a single dollar? Do you think I can show you that? Or did I lose it? I well, think so. Yes, I think you can show us that. Okay. I think, I, I'm thinking too, and I, I'm, I'm becoming uh, quickly a believer here, uh, based on your track record alone. So, well, all right, so let me tell you how you do it. So, Let's say you buy a house with a Fannie Mae uh, loan, right? It's for your own residence. You put down three and a half percent, which is around $10,500. This is called 10,000 breezy math. And now you take out a $290,000 mortgage. And after a couple of years, you move out and you rent it out, right? Now your tenants pay down that mortgage. With every mortgage payment, if you bought it at the right price, the, met, the rent is enough to pay for that mortgage, plus your taxes, plus your insurance, plus a little extra more. The fact is in most residential real estate, you're not going to see a great deal of cash flow if you're using a traditional mortgage of 75 to 80% or more. That's the actual truth. Um, sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. In markets where you buy very low relative to the rents, you will. But in most markets in Florida, you will not see it. But here's what happens. Even in that, in that you, could, you could walk away from that house, you put down $10,000, you could go live somewhere else and make it, have a great career for 28 years. Those tenants paid down that mortgage from 290 to zero. They paid it off for you, right? And now all the money that used to go to the bank now goes to you. So your cash flow skyrockets. So if you're a 30-year-old, by the time you're 60, your 10000 you put away in, uh, in 30 years earlier is now worth 300000 And that's with real estate having never gone up, which never happens, and that in 30 years it never goes up, right? So in a dramatically worst-case scenario, you multiplied your, your equity 30 times, and now you have this cash flow that is absolutely skyrocketing because the mortgage paid off. That's amazing, right? Those are the fundamentals that people don't understand. You create equity every every month with an amortizing payment but but amortizing loan because your, your tenants are paying down your mortgage bill what else is happening the amount of interest you pay reduces because it's an interest on, because it's an amortizing loan if i took out a three hundred thousand dollar loan and had a six percent interest rate and was interest only which is what most investors are told to do so they maximize their cash flow because they're going to sell some appreciation which is not a long-term strategy at all then i'm always paying six percent on 300 i'm always paying uh, eighteen thousand dollars in interest right but if I pay down that mortgage, right, when it's down to 200, I'm only paying 12,000. My interest over the life of that loan is much, much lower. And my, my equity to debt ratio, the amount of equity versus the amount of debt goes up. My balance sheet is stronger because I'm reducing my debt at the same time. These are things that are, that are, that are tremendously important for long-term thinkers. Now, in that same scenario, put down 10, you created 300 in a zero, zero appreciation market. In a normal appreciation market, if it does, let's, let's say it goes up uh, 5% a year or something like that. That is going to double in about 14 years and I'll quadruple in about 28 years. So now you turn $10,000 into about $1.4 million, right? 
That's insane, but that is actually how positive leverage works. Positive leverage, right? Not reckless leverage, not leverage like it can never snow, it can never rain, there's only blue skies ahead. Uh, that's that's those fundamentals. So focus on cash flow, amortization, and positive leverage. You can still benefit from appreciation. I've benefited a lot from appreciation, but I don't hang my hat on it, right? If I get appreciation, it's whipped cream. It turns my home run into a grand slam, right? But, but I can weather the storm because I'm focused on the fundamentals. I'll say one more thing before we wrap up because I know you guys have to uh, uh, close this session. We also try to buy close to or below replacement value. That's important for very fundamental re reasons. The other thing I would, I would say is execute, 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 right? Um, follow through. Um, in real estate, when you're a small investor, there's 365 days in the year. And 355 days, things are just beautiful. The sun shining, there's a bird singing at your at your shoulder. Everything's perfect. But 10 years, just abs 10 days of those absolutely stink. They're terrible. You get a horrible tenant, your water heater breaks. And of course, it always happens on Friday at 8 p.m. when uh, when the, the plumbing call now costs $500 instead of $50 or something like that. And it, it's just, there's 10 days out of the year where it's miserable. But here's the thing. You stick with those 10 days out of the year and you will grow. And you'll get to enjoy those 355. Eventually, you'll build a business where you'll have people you pay to deal with those 10 lousy days. And it won't be so lousy for them either because you, they'll have good paying jobs that are good at what they do. But the truth is, you have to see things through. To see things through. And I see far too many people bail once they get hit with two or three um, difficulties. Um, this is a real business, hence real estate. You have to deal with real situations. Do it right in the overwhelmingly uh, amount of time you will you will enjoy positive results from your from your investment and your work. Wow, Justin! In this short amount of time, the ten dollars you said, look, it turned into a million dollars. Proof in the pudding. Well done, Ajay. Well done. I'll take half. Okay. I'm taking notes on everything, and look, it just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well done. Well, Justin. All jokes aside, but yeah, those. Those all jokes aside, Justin, but all those fundamentals are incredible. Cash flow, meaning the rent you get from the properties and the income, amortization is as 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 you do those payments, there is actually amount that is freeing up, and that's actually equity that you're yeah. building on your property. Positive leverage, getting the right loan, getting the right financing, fixed rate for 30 years. And appreciation is basically just the cherry on the top. That's something you shouldn't be counting on. As long as you make all of the other three decisions on your real estate, you are making a safe and sound decision for a lifetime and for generations to pass. That's how you accumulate wealth for your generations. Thank you so much for that, Justin. And last, uh, if you can touch a little bit into capital raising, uh, that would be really good for our viewers uh, to learn a little bit about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um <clears throat> Okay, without getting uh, too much into the uh, complicated um, math, you know, how you structure things like that, I, I will tell you the following. When, when I started raising money, I, I put my investors entirely, their interests entirely ahead of money, right? In fact, I didn't even charge fees. And even today, we charge fewer and lower fees. Uh, we participate more on the, on the wealth, on the back end if we're successful in creating significant equity um, by improving the property, doing that actual work, paying down the mortgage, and, and, and from picking the right market. We'll also benefit from appreciation, but we don't hang our head on that. So always, always put your investors first. Because here's what here's the, here's the main thing about the investors. An investor, um, an investor is a person who's worked hard their life, most of them, right? And just like you, right? They've, they've worked. And what they've done is, is they foregone consumption on the part of what they earned, and they put it aside for the future, right? And they're putting it aside for their kids or their grandkids or for their retirement or for some foundation or some favorite cause, whatever it is. They have a vision for that money. They have a hope. They have, they have a goal for that money, right? So now they take that money and they give it to you. And they say, here, Eric, here, Adriana, take this money. I heard your project. Yeah, let, let's do it. When they give it to you, they're giving you, they're giving you trust. And there's no, there's no more important thing you can give a healthy person than opportunity and trust. Nothing. As long as you're healthy of mind and body, there's nothing more valuable. So the trust they give you is a sacred trust, and and you should you should you you should have you know blood on the streets before you lose them a dollar. You should be you should be doing everything you can to protect that capital. 
when you do, when you do, when you see it through, you see it through the tough times, you will have such, you you have earned their respect and their gratitude and their trust over the long term. I can't tell many investors just this morning. I have, I have two brothers of mine who've been investing with me for, they're not brothers of mine, sorry, they're brothers. And they've been investing with me for like 12 years. And the first guy invested in me came in my garage. I had a garage office at the time. And he worked with me for, and I paid him like 15, 20 bucks. And he was, he was a former uh, fire chief of a major uh, uh, city, a major city. And he came and worked with me and he ordered windows for me and stuff like that. And he, he was a great guy. We became good friends. Then his brother invested with me. And his brother, he talks to me and he goes, Justin, I want you to explain it to me real slow, real slow. You know, everything he tells me, like, like I'm a 12th, like I'm a 10, uh, 10 year old. Just explain it real slow. We became very good friends. They invested with me. Their mother invested with me. She recently passed, God rest her soul, in, in her 90s. She was like the only woman we had to send checks to, right? And then, um, and then today they, they referred me, they referred someone else and so forth. You don't even have to seek capital after a while. When people know you, when they know that you're committed, with, that you don't want to make money off of your investors. You want to make money for and with your investors. That's the primary thing that has to happen, right? You don't want to make money off your investors. And there are so many people who are structured that they want to make money off their investors. They charge enormous fees. They're, they're, they participate uh, in, the, in the cash flow from the get-go, even if the property is not fully stabilized or, 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 or positioned correctly yet. So even if the property goes wrong, they've already collected all these fees and so forth. They, they, they're, they're, fee, they're fee heavy and everything. I say... Structure it so you make money for and with your investors, not off your investors. And, um, you know, you could be right. You could be wrong. You can be successful. Occasionally, you may miss the mark. Thankfully, we've never, ever failed to reduce a positive return. But if you do that, if, you're, if those are your guiding principles, um, then whatever deal you structure, people can see it. When they give you a chance, you follow through like that. You, you're you're going to build you're gonna build a, a list of investors probably offering you more capital than you can put to work. I'll say one, one other thing. There are trillions of dollars, trillions on the sidelines that are looking to put money. They're looking for responsible stewards of their account. You know, initially I, I talked to these guys, like I told you, my friends, Mike and Tom, we just talked about other people, you know, Chris and Rosna, whose house I just spent, spent, uh, stayed at last night. But, you know, I, I, there are now, I have equity firms out of New York you know, with $4 billion in capital calling me wanting to put it, wanting to put it to work. Because, Money needs to be put to work. Savings need to be put to work. They're looking for responsible stewards of capital. Be a responsible steward of capital. Care about your obligations first before you care about your payday. And, and uh, you'll figure out the rest. And you'll do well. Thank you so much, and Justin, for explaining how you work with uh, capital raising. It's so important that when somebody's putting money into Pax Properties or any other company out there, like you're saying, that they trust that person. Trust is the biggest asset that you can have with somebody. Trust as a friend, trust in business, just trust uh, with God, trust in life. Right. So um, thank you so much uh, for being in this show, for trusting being with us and for trusting um, everything that we're trying to do here in the Power Is Now Real Estate Roundtable, which is give a wealth of knowledge to our viewers about real estate. So delighted to have you here today, Justin. Thank you for that opportunity. And uh, that is, will be a wrap. Thank you so much to all our viewers on the Real Estate Roundtable. My name is Adriana Montes with Florida Dreams Ra Real Realty. Thank you. The Power Is Now Media is worldwide with growing audience of future home buyers, investors, builders, developers, real estate agents, and brokers. The Power Is Now Media is well positioned to increase awareness and produce results for our growing roster of advertising partners. An advertisement on any of our platforms is the right step toward reaching and communicating key brand messages to a targeted network of individuals, families, and communities interested in housing. Our content areas include feature stories and profiles on successful real estate agents, business owners, government, and community leaders. The Power Is Now magazines are the leading resource for real estate agents, mortgage bankers, entrepreneurs, and small home ownership businesses, providing leaders with business strategy information, resources, and tools through PIN, real estate, and programming guide magazines. Stay up to the minute with real estate and mortgage news and information from industry experts. VIP agents are able to feature listings each week. 
The Power Is Now TV radio podcast features weekly shows that include Homebuyers Town Hall, Real Estate Roundtable, VIP Agent Spotlight, and so much more. Each week, VIP agents have opportunities to be featured guests on the shows. VIP agents can discuss and showcase houses, neighborhoods, and provide brief introduction. The interviews are unlimited 10 to 15 minutes on each current listing. This product alone separates you from your competition. The Power Is Now delivers to you market update interview to promote listing weekly, promotional biographical video, co-host a bi-monthly homebuyers town hall show, featured subject matter expert on real estate roundtable show, the Power Is Now Program Guide e-magazine. The Power Is Now National e-magazine. Article writing and blogging. Social media content customization. Inclusion and press releases. Graphic design services. Business and performance coaching. Technology support. Referrals. Lead generation opportunities and management support.